Next question, Imam Sahib, if you have any. Yes, I have got one question sent by Mahadabuz from, ah, Mahadabuz. from Egypt. <coughs> she has quoted three verses of the Holy Quran. I will read Did them first. Did she observe our last program in which her previous question was answered? I have not checked that. I don't know where she has disappeared. Mahadabuz. I think she's still in Egypt. Huh? I think she's still in Egypt. Still in Egypt, but yeah. the address is not known. Yes, hmm. She went very much frustrated with, uh, you know, with some things in life. Yeah. And uh, although she, her amadith is absolutely upright and <coughs> very solid, but she has been somehow kept away from circulation by her family. So that is why we don't know of any direct address of Mahadabu's. Yeah. If she is listening to this, this program, she may please contact me and let yeah. me know how can I write back to her. Yeah. Because all messages <coughs> cannot be delivered to MTA, you know. Yes. Okay, please. Mm. <coughs> so the three verses she has quoted, I will read them first of all. The first one is from Surah Ibrahim, verse number five. Yes. It says, "Auzu billahi min ash-shaitan rajim wa ma arsalna min rasulin illa bi lisan qawmihi li yubayyana lahum fa yudillu Allahu man yasha'u wa yahdi man yasha'u wa huwa al-azizul hakim." Translation is, "And we have not sent any messenger except with the language of his people in order that he might make things clear to them." Right. Then Allah lets go astray whom he wills and guides whom guides whom he wills and he is the mighty the wise the question <coughs> yes uh, after three verses uh, no, no. yes every the, question should be asked separately yeah. what are the what is the question raised based on this verse uh, she says that uh, we know that the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent to all the people of all times to come so how can we explain the following three verses this was the first one and there are two others. I understand. She is making one question out of the three verses combined. Yes, okay. Read the next <coughs> The one. second verse is from Surah An Nahal, verse number 104. It says, وَلَكَدْ نَعْلَمُوا أَنَّهُمْ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّمَا يُوَلِّمُهُ بَشَرْ لِسَانُ الَّذِي يُلْهِدُونَ إِلَيْهِ عَجَمِيٌ وَحَازَ لِسَانٌ عَرَبِيٌ مُبِينٌ Correct. Translation is, and indeed we know that they say that it is only a man who teaches him. But the tongue of him to whom they unjustly incline in making this insinuation is foreign, while this is Arabic language, Arabic tongue, plain and clear. The third verse is from Surah Shuara, verse, in the two verses, 100, 199 and 200, this says, And if we had sent it down to one of the non-Arabs, and he had read it to them, even then they would never have believed in it. The question she has raised is that these verses can be understood wrongly that the Holy Prophet ﷺ was only sent for the Arabs and that the non-Arabs will not believe in him. So please explain this point and what is meant by the above three verses. First of all, let me give my compliment to her for uh, doing some homework before yeah. raising this question. <laughs> she has collected all the relevant verses together. But if she had read the first verse with, any, with careful attention, the answer would have been found there. There is an immediate people whom a prophet addresses. And it is impossible for the address to be delivered to them if they do not know the language. So Qomihi refers to the Arabs among whom he was born, among whom he was raised, and who had to understand him. But it does not mean that his message was limited to the Arabs. Arabs should understand the language in which they were addressed. From then on, it was their responsibility to learn other languages and convey the message all across the world. This is exactly what they did. So it does not 
confine the message to the people to whom it is primarily addressed. What is essential is the people who are primarily addressed, they should learn the language, they should know the language. I don't see any objection against this. All three verses produce the same effect. For instance, one verse requires the Arabs to consider if the Holy Prophet had started speaking a foreign language to them, like Persian or anybody, anything else, they had every right to reject him. They would say, what are you talking about? We don't understand these things. But he did not. He spoke Arab, clear Arabic, which was the tongue of the Arabs. Similarly, if they, they refer this book to somebody, some person, human, other than God, of course other than God, but some source other than God, they refer this to an Ajami, who, Ajami, whose language is not Arabic. So if he had taught him, then the language in which the Holy Quran is revealed should have exposed itself to be not the language of God, not the language of someone who knows Arabic so beautifully well, so profoundly well. So an Ajami, te Ajami teacher would have introduced many such expressions which were found to be non-Arab, non-Arabic in the sense of they being Fusa. So the Arabs could have detected that immediately. All three verses are related to the language in which Ahadur addressed his people. And the same applies to all the people of the world. Whenever a prophet is raised from among them, he primarily addresses them in their own language and uh, it does not necessarily relate to all the revelations of such a person. The question here is which language, language he uses to address his people and how he delivers the message of God to them in a language they can clearly understand. Like Hazrat Muslim Salaam wrote most of his books in Urdu, which was the lingua franca of India. And although there were many people in India who did not understand Urdu, but Urdu was ling the lingua franca of India, there is no doubt about it. So translations were made and they, they are being still prepared to address the people who do not understand the language directly. But the primary address was to those Muslims, the Muslims of India, who knew the language so well. The Muslims almost everywhere in India knew Urdu. And also the main body of the Punjabi literate people, where he was raised, knew Urdu so well, Punjabi was not at that time even written. It was a verbal language, but it was not written. So this is exactly what the Holy Quran is speaking about in the three verses referred to by our dear sister Maha. The only valid question raised on the basis of these three verses should have been he, Muhammad Rasulullah was not sent to one people alone. He was sent to all the world. And this verse would perhaps indicate to some that uh, each of the people to whom Ahadur was sent should have been addressed in the same language by Ahadur sallallahu alayhi wa himself. This is the impression which might have been created upon some people who read these verses. 
But I want to remind them all that the Holy Quran, when it defines a prophet's jurisdiction, does not mention any language at all. It mentions the jurisdiction of a prophet without mentioning any language. But when it speaks of the immediate people to whom he belongs originally, Qom he, then he speaks of the language. So at the same time, keep this verse, these verses aside and turn to the jurisdiction of Islam. There the language is not discussed at all. Annas and Jamia is mentioned and no language is mentioned. So languages can be translated. They can be later on, uh, you know, by the, later on many scholars are born in the same religion who learn other languages or who belong to people who know other languages they come from different countries and learn Islam from the Arabs, for instance, while their own language is not Arabic. Then they return back to their people. And now they will begin to give them the message in the language they understand. So this also is mentioned in the Holy Quran, where it says that why not people from different areas where Islam has reached, send their representatives to Mecca and Medina, Medina particularly at that, at that time, and to the center of Islam so that they learn Islam from the people to whom Islam was first bestowed. Then they return to their people and start addressing. Now, all the delegations which came from different places during their lifetime of Umar Rasulullah Sallam, do they, did they speak Arabic when they went back? They always address their people behind in their language. So, and in that they were representative of Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So whoever represents him, will begin to speak the language of his own people and will begin to address them in their own language. But the original Islam be, which such a delegation should have learned was from Arabic speaking people to begin with. That is how it began to, understand, to spread. And later on, Arabic itself was taken up so seriously by the Muslim scholars all over the world, that whether they were Chinese or Persian or Indian or whatever name you give them, they all first learned Arabic to understand the Quran and Hadith, etc. And uh, then they translated the message and uh, spoke to the people in their own language. This whole process has no contradiction in itself, in it. It has a consistent flow and uh, there is no contradictions to be resolved as I have explained things to you.